Hi, good uh, afternoon uh, from the East Coast of the United States. Um, I'm in Boston today. I um, was filming a PBS special yesterday with Dr. Rudy Tanzi on mind, brain, body, and consciousness. This uh, PBS special will be released uh, sometime in March uh, and in February uh, we will also be releasing our book together which is called The Healing Self. So we had a great time yesterday. Sorry for the interrupt uh, but I hope it doesn't happen again. So I said uh, Dr. Rudy Tanzi and I had a great time yesterday filming our PBS special on mind, brain, body, and universe. Uh, our book, The Healing Self, will be coming out in February as well. And the public television show will be uh, in uh, March. As usual, I'm here to answer your questions on any topic. And most of the questions have been coming in from readers of You Are the Universe, Discovering Your Cosmic Self and why it matters. So um, your questions can be sent to info at jio.com, info at jio.com. Once again, your questions can be sent to info at jio.com, info at jio.com. They are placed in a queue and I answer them uh, in the order that they are received. And I do my best to do so every day. Um, while you're at it, please download the app, Jyo, J-I-Y-O. This is our platform for us together to engage in uh, uh, creating a more peaceful, just sustainable and healthier and joyful world. We have many faculty members on Jio, you can become a member by going to jio.com, J I Y O.com, and uh, you will find uh, teachers on every aspect of well being, um, faculty members who are experts on, um, on uh, things like um, uh, sleep, stress management, meditation, mindfulness. Uh, personal relationships, love, romance, nutrition, nourishment, uh, grounding, emotional well-being, emotional intelligence, and even financial well-being. So do join us at jio.com. Today's question is a request from Suraj Pandey. And Suraj Pandey says, can you uh, do a video on the Bhagavad Gita as uh, it has all the answers for all the questions that we ask as far as I'm concerned. Is that correct? So what I will do is uh, uh, do my best to give you right now the core teachings of the Bhagavad Gita. First of all, the Bhagavad Gita is uh, considered a religious text by many Hindus, but uh, it is also uh, one of the Upanishads. And there are over a hundred Upanishads, and these Upanishads are core teachings about consciousness and enlightenment. And they are usually in the form of a dialogue between a Rishi, a seer, and the Rishi's disciple. And they're all meant to give uh, you insight into the nature of reality and the nature of existence and also the means to enlightenment or deep understanding of the nature of existence. So the Bhagavad Gita is one of those Upanishads. And um, um, it's considered one of the more important Upanishads. The two principles 
principal characters in the Bhagavad Gita are a warrior uh, called Arjuna and his teacher Krishna who is uh, the incarnation of divinity. So um, Krishna represents the incarnation of divinity and Arjuna represents a virtuous being but still identifying with the ego and um, uh, always um, favoring the evolution of consciousness in the direction of uh, uh, truth, goodness, beauty, harmony, love, compassion, joy and equanimity. And the story, um, which is a metaphor, uh, starts uh, with a great battle on a field called Kurukshetra. And uh, Kurukshetra is the battlefield where the forces of uh, um, virtuous beings and virtuous people or good people um, are engaged in battle with the forces of evil and um, therefore it is a battle between um, truth and ignorance metaphorically speaking and uh, of course do bear in mind that this is my version okay this is my version my interpretation shared by many but also not necessarily shared by everyone Okay, so here we are on the battlefield uh, of truth versus ignorance. The forces of creativity and enlightenment and the forces of darkness and ignorance. And the battlefield, metaphorically speaking, is our own mind. The battlefield, metaphorically speaking, is our own mind. And when I say mind, I mean our own conditioned mind, because all minds are ultimately conditioned. So it doesn't matter if you're on the uh, side of uh, uh, what we interpret as truth, goodness, beauty, harmony, or on the side of what we interpret as darkness or evil, but um, all of us have a conditioned mind. And those that we consider um, our enemies or our adversaries are uh, just uh, minds with a different kind of conditioning. And the conditioning, of course, goes deep. It is um, a result of um, uh, religion, it's a result of economics, it's a result of geographical location, a result of uh, the conditioning of our parents. Hi, Aurora. I'm here. Thank you for being here. Um, so the conditioning is deep. It's a historical conditioning, religious conditioning, economic conditioning, geographical conditioning, uh, mythical conditioning, religious conditioning, and today even scientific conditioning, which means viewing the world through what is called scientism. So um, um, as a result of that, of course, there's a lot of conflict in the world because, as I said, we look at people who have a different uh, conditioning than ours as our adversaries and also uh, as uh, sometimes our enemies. And then we go uh, to battle with them. And we go to frequently uh, war with them and we disagree with them and we have arguments with them and we fight with them, etc. So in this particular text, the Bhagavad Gita, uh, Krishna and Arjuna representing the spirit and ego respectively are arrayed on the battlefield of the conditioned mind and um, very early on what happens is that Krishna has a panic attack because as he looks across the battlefield he sees his enemies 
as um, his own relatives, his own cousins. And he tells Krishna, uh, how can I fight these enemies? Um, because they are my own relatives. They are my own brothers. They are my own cousins. And I do not want to kill them. And so at this point, Arjuna um, gives him a lesson on um, the nature of um, enlightenment and the nature of yoga and the nature of deep understanding of reality. This in the Bhagavad Gita takes about 18 chapters. And by the end of this, um, um, Arjuna um, has a deeper understanding of reality and is very close to, um, to uh, enlightenment. And so I would say the Bhagavad Gita is a, a very important core text that teaches us the deeper meaning of yoga. So after 15 second break, I will, um, I will uh, um, do a summary on what the core teachings of the Bhagavad Gita are. Okay, thank you. So I'm back here and now I'm going to go over the core teachings of the Bhagavad Gita as taught to Arjuna by Krishna, as uh, taught to the fragmented um, and uh, tortured ego self by the wholeness of spirit. Um, it is a teaching in yoga and uh, and uh, the teaching in yoga uh, first requires us to understand what the word yoga means. And the word yoga literally means union. In fact, um, the first sutra of Patanjali in the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali is that um, yoga is um, the settling of the mind into pure consciousness which is the source of all existence. So the English word, word yoga uh, is connected to the, sorry, the Sanskrit word yoga is connected to the English word uh, yoke. Um, famous quote of Jesus Christ, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. My yoke is easy and my burden is light and the word yoke of course means union binding of the individual self and settling of the individual self which is finite into the infinite ocean of consciousness non-local eternal and timeless okay so the word yoga the word yoke the word yuj the word union with source are all the same word. Okay, in the Bhagavad Gita, in the 18 chapters, Krishna teaches four types of yoga. The first yoga is referred to as the royal yoga, royal yoga, and it's called Raj Yoga. And this royal yoga includes uh, uh, methods of self-inquiry. Who am I? What do I want? What is my purpose? What am I grateful for? How do I experience reality? So self-inquiry, it includes uh, many types of uh, mindfulness awareness techniques and it includes transcendence, but also awareness of mind awareness of mental space, awareness of perceptual experience, awareness of body, awareness of uh, uh, sensations of the body, and uh, one or the other aspects of yoga, yama, niyama, yama and niyama are observances for personal and social contact, 
pratyahara, withdrawal of the senses, uh, pranayam, breathing techniques, um, dhyan, meditation, dharna, focused attention, and samadhi, which is uh, going beyond subject-object split and experiencing transcendence. So actually, Krishna teaches Arjuna Raj Yoga first. And then he um, uh, teaches uh, him uh, the yoga of love and devotion, which is called Bhakti Yoga. Love for an ideal uh, vision for humanity and other sentient beings. Love for um, other humans but also love for um, that which is sacred. And so this aspect of yoga is called bhakti yoga, or the yoga of love, which includes, of course, uh, um, uh, many, many uh, other um, aspects of uh, love, but that include compassion, that include empathy, that include joy, that include peace and equanimity. And then the third yoga that um, um, is taught um, by Krishna in this Upanishads is the yoga of, uh, uh, of um, intellectual inquiry. Um, and the yoga of understanding, the yoga of how do we use the mind to go beyond the mind. And then finally, uh, the fourth yoga that is taught uh, by Lord Krishna is, uh, oh yes, the, that yoga of the intellect is called Gyan Yoga. Thanks, Aurora, for reminding me. And then the final yoga that is taught is uh, the yoga of, um, of karma. Uh, how do we uh, embody the understanding of Raj Yoga, uh, Gyan Yoga, and Bhakti Yoga, and how does it translate into the yoga of action, or karmically correct action, and uh, karmically correct action is basically love and understanding and being centered in grounded in awareness as the basis of all uh, action. So when action um, comes from the integrity of being established in being, then that action is holy and it heals. It heals everyone. Okay, so as I am um, um, speaking here, uh, I see somebody called goddesses or goddess in new consciousness persistently uh, making a point that is... Uh, why is India a poor country and why has yoga not helped India? So let me try and answer that query from this person, uh, uh, goddesses, uh, as she calls herself. So here is the answer. We tend to romanticize an entire culture based on the teachings of a few luminaries. But throughout the ages, throughout the ages, um, humanity has been by and large um, very brutal. Humanity by and large has uh, been, um, been operating from a very tribal identity. And humanity, by and large, has um, uh, functioned in a way where uh, <clears throat> the principle of <coughs> brutality and survival of the fittest has ruled. 
in a way that ensured our survival. But now it is um, threatening the survival of the uh, human species and threatening survival everywhere of all life on our planet. And that kind of ignorance of um, separate self is ultimately responsible for all the problems um, that we face today. Uh, from ethnocentrism, racism, bigotry, hatred, prejudice, uh, extinction of species, climate change, mechanized death, uh, nuclear weapons, I could go on and on, but we know that the uh, separate self-identity has created all the problems of humanity. But from time and time immemorial in all cultures, not just India, there have been luminaries. And the sages of the Upanishads and the authors of uh, the Bhagavad Gita were among those luminaries. But the rest of India uh, was still stuck in its identity of its separate self and is still stuck in that identity. And that is the cause of uh, radical poverty and social injustice and economic injustice and human suffering and pollution and everything and that leads to or threatens our survival. So just because there were a few luminaries historically in India and even now, uh, does not, uh, that principle does not apply to an entire culture. Now we can take that example and we can extend it to any culture. So, uh, you know, when we look at Greek culture, we have luminaries like uh, Socrates and Plato and Aristotle and Pythagoras and Parmenides. We have um, Hermes Magistus, the great Egyptian alchemist. And I could name all these luminaries in, uh, in Greece that uh, gave rise to an enormous amount of enlightened literature. And, you know, you can go into the Greek mythologies and we discover <coughs> that uh, the Iliad and the Odyssey have very similar um, insights into the nature uh, of the divided self, into human nature, which can be both sacred and profane, which can be both diabolical and divine. So in the midst of all these luminaries, that I mentioned in ancient Greece, there was still slavery. There were times when uh, people were sacrificed uh, to lions. There were gladiator games. And there was a lot of uh, enslavement and torture and violence and everything that we consider <coughs> not very enlightening. And yet we romanticize about ancient Greece. We do so with every culture. And, you know, the glory of Great Britain was uh, supposedly its colonial past, where uh, <clears throat> if you wore a uniform and you were paying allegiance uh, to king or queen, then you had the permission to kill other people, commit rape and conquest, and all about um, um, all the things that come from the ignorance of uh, the evil um, part of our human nature, or we may say the ignorant part of our human nature. Now I see that uh, Goddess is um, uh, interrupting persistently and she says why are you talking about the past uh, address the new so I am about to but she doesn't seem to have too much patience and what I'm saying is that today is no different today is the same situation 
there are a few luminaries in the world. Um, in fact, there may be more luminaries today than um, than um, than there were in the past. Um, and there were luminaries in all the indigenous peoples of the world as well. You know, in um, the indigenous people of uh, North and South America, in the Aborigines uh, of Australia, and on and on. So there have been luminaries throughout history, but today there is the opportunity to create um, a new paradigm as we extend the ecosystem in which people start to awaken. And that can only happen uh, through the awakening of uh, uh, individuals. So unless there is uh, personal transformation, there cannot be social or collective transformation. And so if, um, uh, if uh, we want to create a new paradigm, then we need a critical mass of, um, um, of uh, people who are awakening to the one reality, which is pure consciousness or pure mind, which is uh, um, uh, beyond all conditioned minds. There are innumerable conditioned minds, but there is only one pure consciousness. And in that knowing, in that uh, abiding in pure consciousness, is the spontaneous awakening of love. And it is a love that heals because it is beyond all conditioning. And that is what we need to collectively wake up to. Uh, so I hope that answers um, um, the uh, objections of uh, this person who calls herself uh, goddess. Uh, and in order for her to truly express uh, that um, um, goddess, divine, feminine, she too must um, uh, help by um, not uh, arguing from one conditioned mind to another conditioned mind, but transcending and uh, um, going to that level uh, which is um, uh, pure uh, love and uh, pure creativity and uh, evolution. I see she is disagreeing, but that's all right. Okay, so um, um, this is the last time I will be addressing uh, uh, Goddess in your consciousness because uh, uh, she persistently raises the same objections. I wish you the best, uh, dear Goddess, and uh, um, thank you for contributing to this discussion. In um, the uh, meanwhile, let us all um, get together here every day uh, to the extent that we can and collectively through pers personal and social transformation um, um, try and reach that critical mass for a more peaceful, just, sustainable, healthier and joyful world. I'll see you tomorrow.